At this time, I'm going to ask if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and start turning once more to the book of Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, the second portion of Paul's, I would call it a hymn or, or some type of, of song almost, because what Paul is speaking of in Philippians 2 is of great importance to the Christian. And what we see in Philippians 2, we'll be looking this morning at uh, verses 9 through 12. We see that Christ has been granted a place above all else. He's been granted a position that goes far beyond what I would even begin to say that we can imagine. And that is, he is given the name above all names, and he has great authority. Now we're going to look at this in hopefully its totality and see how this affects the Christian life. Because of who Jesus is now, because of what he has done and accomplished, how this is going to be what drives us forward in life. So with that in mind, let's look, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And Paul writes, Wherefore God also hath exalt, highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and on things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we have to ultimately back up a little bit. I know we looked at the previous text last week, but in order for us to fully understand what's going on here, we have to understand what Paul is saying when he says, wherefore God has highly exalted him. He's saying, because of what Jesus has done, he is now exalted to this place of great authority. Now we looked at last week at the idea of Christ humbling himself and being a servant. If you look at Philippians 2, 6 through 8, we see that very reality that, that Jesus was and is God in the flesh. He's equal in that regard. It says in verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So we see and we saw last week, Jesus is that second person of the Trinity. He is in every way God. And he saw that it was not robbery to equal himself with God. He is the same. Uh, and again, the Trinity in and of itself is a, a, a mind-altering idea. It's something that you could spend hours and hours and hours just beginning to think about. But then it tells us he was God, but he humbled himself. It says, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. We know this, of course, uh, the combination, if you will, of the Christmas and the Easter story kind of being told here that says he was found in the image of a man, meaning he was born of a virgin. He was in flesh. He's 100% human while also retaining his divinity. He's 100% God. Now, in verse 8, it tells us of that latter portion of his life tells us, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And this is where we see the story of the gospel itself. This is the gospel. If you ever, you know, have someone ask you, well, what is the gospel? Well, this is it, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, and he lived a perfect life, and he died a death for you and I who were his very 
enemies. I want you to think about that. Romans 5 tells us that very clearly, that you and I, before our atonement, before the atonement has been made, we were the enemies of God. Romans 5, verses 6 through 9. Listen to what Paul says in this passage. He's writing here on the reality that you and I were enemies of the Lord. And yet he showed us grace. Romans 5, 6 through 9 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But here's the importance of this text. In verse 8, But God commendeth, or he shows his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Through him. I want you to take note that this is what is being spoken of here, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, the, the essential truth of Christianity, the essential, the center point of our faith is Christ dying on the cross and being our redeemer. This is what caused this next verse and the verses to follow to occur going back to Philippians 2 verse 9 it tells us wherefore meaning because of this because Christ has died on the cross because he's risen from the dead because he's given us salvation God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name now this is one of those things in scripture that I think that if you just read it you can just miss something completely. Because this has caused me this week to think and think and think. Because I want you to take what Paul is saying here. He's saying that because Jesus has done this, he exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. This is one of those things that I, I don't know that I'll ever fully understand with my feeble human mind. Because Jesus was already God. He was already exalted prior to this. And we know that to be the case very much so. We're going to look at the scripture in a moment. I'm going to read a, a quote, and I'm going to, it's going to be split into two different parts. But I'm going to read the first part, and then we'll look at a passage of scripture. This is from John MacArthur, and he tells us, For the most part, Jesus' exaltation involved the restoration of, of what, etern what he had eternally possessed before his incarnation. And what he's basically saying there is when Jesus returned to the Father, that the glory that he had since eternity past was once more his. He reclaimed his full glory, if you will. He was fully God and fully man, don't get me wrong, but when he was back with the Father after his resurrection and his ascension, he's now exalted once more in this wonderful way. And we know this to be the case. John 17 tells us that. Jesus in John 17, uh, this, if you are ever feeling perhaps disheartened, I would encourage you. John 17 is a wonderful place to find comfort because Jesus prays for you and I. Jesus asks his heavenly father to be with us. He says, be with those who have not yet come. That's you and I. But in John 17, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. I want you to notice what Jesus says in regards to who he is and who he had been prior to his first advent on earth. John 17, starting in verse 3, Jesus says, and this is is life eternal that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished the work which thou gavest me to do and now notice what he says in verse 5 and now o father glorify thou me with thine own self 
with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So we know that before he came into this physical earth, took on the form of humanity, he had great glory. He was already highly exalted. And yet, now the scripture tells us God exalts him even more. It's hard for me to even imagine God being exalted even higher than he already is. But what I understand this to mean is that because of what Jesus has done, he's now been granted new uh, responsibilities almost. This idea that God is giving him more uh, of, of himself. God's giving him more tasks to do and to accomplish. Going back to that quote, this is a, it's a rather lengthy quote. But I want you to truly try and, and listen to what this is is saying John MacArthur goes on to explain he says remember he had just said you know when Jesus is exalted he's given the name above all names that he he basically reclaims what was already his but then he goes on to say however it seems clear that in some ways Jesus received even more in his exaltation than he had surrendered in his incarnation he was not any more divine or perfect it was not possible for him to be further elevated in any way as far as his essential nature. But because of his perfect redemptive work, the Father bestowed upon the Son even more rights, privileges, honors, and responsibilities than he had before. The exaltation was therefore more than a mere reversal of the incarnation. It was the Father giving the Son honor and tribute he could only receive after his redemptive sacrifice, which he made in obedience to the Father. And again, that's one of those things. I don't know that I'll fully ever grasp this, that Jesus was exalted even more. But what we have to understand is in his being exalted, Jesus is given a name above every name. And he's given the authority in the sense that every single person in heaven on earth and under the earth they must bow at his authority they will have no choice there's a time that will come when jesus christ will be presented in this way and the world the heavens and everything else will have to declare the glory of christ Going back to our original text, let's look at verses 9 through 11 of Philippians 2. It tells us, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the father now i tell you this i will say i don't believe this has occurred yet because there are people obviously today who do not declare christ as lord this is not a universal salvation that's being spoken of this is a moment in time when all of creation will recognize christ as king now the believer for us, this will be a joyous occasion. This will be a time when we look to Christ and our faith is made sight and we see Christ is lifted up and glorified and we will honor him and praise him and glorify him. Us, along with uh, the heavenly hosts, we will be in a state of joyousness. But the unbeliever, those things, if you will, under the earth, the demons, the enemies of God, this will not be a joyous occasion. They will be admitting that Christ is Lord, yet knowing they did not believe, yet knowing they did not agree. Now, if you will, turn with me to Revelations 19. We're going to see Jesus has a name that is given to him. Now, when it tells us that God gave him a name, there are some who would believe that Jesus' name has now physically changed. I don't necessarily hold to that idea, but I, I believe his title has changed in this regard. 
This is who Jesus is. I believe this is the name that is given to Christ. Revelation 19, verse 16, we see John write. He's, he's seeing Christ. He says, and he hath on his vesture, meaning on him, is written, and it's written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is who Jesus is. He's, he's that now. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. We often will recognize that earthly nations, we, we fail to realize and, and remember this. Earthly nations and earthly leaders only have such power. They only have a limited power. Now to us, their power may seem far-reaching and great and overwhelming. But there is one who is above all. And he's not just a few steps above the worldly leaders. He is high and exalted, and that is Christ. He is king of kings. He is above all the nations. He is sovereign. He has all authority. This, this title leads us to that reality. If he is king of kings and lord of lords, then he has authority like no one else. This is where, uh, when we look at places like the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 18, right before Jesus commands his disciples to go out into the world and make disciples, to teach them the truths of Scripture, to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he tells them something of great importance in a brief statement. Matthew 28, verse 18 tells us that. It says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying... All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's why when we, we hear this great commission, it says, Go ye therefore, or therefore go, meaning because Christ is over all, because he is king of kings, because he is lord of lords, he's got all authority in heaven and in earth. We have no need to fear the repercussions that we may face for his name. For in the end, he will be glorified. This is, in fact, actually a very interesting Old Testament prophecy. Paul is quoting from Isaiah when he tells uh, the Philippian church that there is coming one who everyone will have to bow before. Isaiah, in Isaiah 42, uh, excuse me, Isaiah 45 and 22 tells us this reality. Isaiah 45 verse 22, we see that the scripture says this. It says, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me, this is God, unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and glory. This is the idea here. Those who are incensed against the Lord, those who are the enemies of God, when this time comes that he calls forth all to bow before him and give him glory, those who are his enemies will be ashamed. But those who are, as it says, the seed of Israel, Abraham's descendants, we know in Galatians, Paul, he essentially says that's anybody who believes on Christ. We are the blessing of Abraham. We will be justified and we will have great glory. This is the truth of who Jesus is now and our hope that is to come. Now I want to read out of Revelation chapter 5. We looked at this actually as part of our scripture reading. Brother Art read verses 1 through 10 of Revelation 5. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14 because he goes on to tell us, John writes this and says that this is what's going to occur. 
when Jesus is presented to the world and all will have to worship him. It says, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I'll tell you, if you are familiar at all with Handel's Messiah, this is one of those songs that uh, it just is of great beauty. It says, he will receive all of these things. This is, he is worthy of them. Now going on to verse 13, it says, Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such are in the sea, all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. This is a day that is coming when Christ will be worshipped by all of creation. And it's a day that we as believers look forward to. But there's a verse here in our main text this morning that I don't want us to forget. Because we know that God has exalted Christ to this position. He is, he is king of kings. He's lord of lords. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now while we are waiting for that culmination to occur where Jesus returns and we see this moment occur where all of creation worships him, while we are waiting, we're not just supposed to be twiddling our thumbs, just biding our time, Saying, well, just waiting. Got nothing else to do. No, we have much to do. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52 tell us this. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now Matthew 24 tells us that we don't know when that day is. No one knows except the Father. Which means Christ could return today. He could return tomorrow. He could return two weeks from now, 20 years from now. We don't know the timeline. But scripture teaches us we are to live as if it is now, as if it is on the horizon and in sight. That's why if you look back to our main text in Philippians chapter 2, we see in verse 12, Paul gives us another wherefore. He gives us another, you know, uh, teaching of because of this. You know, we saw earlier because Christ did all of these things on the cross and he was resurrected, he's exalted. And then Paul says, because he's exalted, look what he says in verse 12 of Philippians 2. He says, because of this reality that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, he says, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he's saying, because we know Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, we know he reigns upon the throne, we've got work to do. We have action ahead of us. And that is to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I love how theologian George Muller puts it. He says, the believer must finish, must carry to conclusion, must apply to its fullest consequences what is already given by God in principle. He must work out what God in his grace has worked in. So he's not saying, Paul's not saying work off your salvation. Do enough good works to be worthy of the salvation you have. He's saying because you've been given salvation, you must now live in light of that salvation, you must live for the glory of God in that salvation. 
There's a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 6. I want you to turn there if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 and then we'll read 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Paul, I believe, puts it so clearly. One of my favorite, I will say, this is probably my favorite verse in the scripture is 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Because it tells us the gospel in one pure and, and concise sentence. For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's the message of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and through him we are made righteous in the eyes of God. He justifies us before our heavenly Father. Now look at the next verse in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. I love this, the idea Paul is saying, because of what Christ has done, because of who Christ now is, because he is King of kings and Lord of lords, we don't have time to waste our lives. We don't have time to throw away our ambition for lesser things. We must not receive the grace of God in vain, but we receive it knowing that we have work to do. And that work is to live for the glory of God. Now that can be done in many different ways. I'm not going to try and preach a whole other sermon right now on that. That could be a sermon series of how we can glorify God. But I, I simply want you to understand that if you believe this truth that Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, then you've got to respond by the way you live your life. You've got to live that truth out. Faith is what we believe on the inside. But faith should never remain on the inside. Faith should always be seen on the outside. If you believe in something, it should be clearly evident in your life. We believe many different things. I tell you, there are so many truths that we hold to that we don't even realize that we believe and act on these beliefs. One of my favorite examples uh, that I hear time and time again is you, whether you realized it or not, when you sat down this morning in this facility, you believed that that pew was going to hold you up. You might not have recognized it. You might not have thought when you're sitting down, I pray God that this doesn't fall down. You probably didn't say that. Well, you believed it. Maybe subconsciously you had that faith, you trusted in it. And because you trusted in it, you acted on it, you sat. Similarly, but on a much grander scale, if we believe in Christ, we must act on that belief. We must act on our faith. And if he has called us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, if he's called us to live for the glory of God, then we must live for the glory of God. I tell you this morning, God desires us to know this truth, that he is highly exalted and worthy of all praise. And there's coming a day when all creation will give him that glory. But let us not wait for that day to start glorifying him. Let us start now. My prayer for us here at this church is simply that, that we find ways to bring glory to God in every little and, and even big action that we take, that we might be able to find joy in worshiping and glorifying him in the here and now. That is my prayer for us, and I pray that God would add his blessing to the reading and the studying of his word.